I'm going to share with you a story when I was growing up in Peaks Island in Maine. Just while I'm walking here, I think thinking about like this one. So uh, I grew up on an island, as many of you are well aware, Casco Bay, Maine. The island was called Peaks Island. Uh, there's a school there, K through five. And uh, growing up on an island is just freaking awesome, man, because you're, you're constrained to the island. And uh, you do whatever you want. You know, as long as you don't get on a boat, you're stuck on the island, which is very liberating in a lot of ways, uh, very uh, constraining in other ways for sure. But as a kid, it's fantastic. Now, the funny thing is you don't really know any better. That's, that's the interesting thing about being a kid. You don't really know you're poor. Maybe you kind of do, you know, in some cases. But, you know, at the end of the day, somebody might have more clothes than you do. Their parents might have a car, TV, <laughs> not a party line telephone. But at the end of the day, like, eh, whatever. It's all good. Um... Because you're a kid. You're just like, I just want to hang out, get enough food in my belly to go hang out with my friends and play. Go to the beach, you know, hit on the summer girls that come. Not really because I was too shy. But anyway, go down there and pretend like it's going to hit on them. Uh, go hang out, you know, play in the woods. It's just a freaking great life on an island. It really is. I mean, it's not perfect, man. We always look nostalgically on the past. It's easy to forget how bad things were but you know, at the end of the day there's something very liberating and yet constraining about living on an island oh you creeping charlie i hate creeping charlie look at all that dude oh, you probably can't see all that just going up there into those pines yeah anyway i'm not sure those oaks or maples or elms i don't know all right so the first time the two times would jump out at me my first time being free. I just remember I had a, pe a penny and a nickel. And we used to have this uh, fire plug in our, right in the front yard of our house. Fire hydrant. Um, and I just remember this like it was yesterday. It was bright yellow. And I stand out there and I had six cents. I can't remember if I got it for, I forgot how I got it. But anyway, I remember my mom telling me that I could go down to the uh, store if I wanted to by myself and buy some candy. I must have been five or six years old. And this is like 1975, 76, my friends. So I might have been even younger than, I don't know. But you know, five cents, you could buy three pieces of candy, right? Or six, you could buy three penny pieces or five, six penny pieces or three two cent pieces or a combination thereof. You gotta get your math skills going. Well, anyway, I remember going down there and buying that candy. That's pretty fun. It was kind of nerve-wracking because I had never walked to the store by myself. It was literally just right down Central Ave, take a left on, uh, was it Island Ave? I can't remember what that main street was. And there was Feeney's store right there, which later on became the post office when they, uh, they did a rebuild of Feeney's and made it big like a grocery. Anyway, so I did that, and that was pretty cool. But the, the, that wasn't that much. The first time, though, the real first time of being free, and I don't know how or when or where or what, if my mom forced me or if I convinced her or what, but she let me go into town into Portland all by myself. I mean, I got to take the boat all by myself, get off the boat all by myself, and walk around Portland all by myself. Now, even back then, and it's still today, you know, Portland back then was 65,000 people, which it still is today. But Maine did not have a million people back then, I don't think. So 65,000 people uh, back then was a hell of a lot bigger than it is now relative to the overall population. And Portland was pretty much maxed out uh, other than going up. And I don't think they're, anyway, I don't think it's ever going to be more than, 65, 70,000 people. So 40, eh, probably 40, 45 years later, Portland isn't nearly as big, relatively speaking, to the rest of the state as it was back then. Now, it wasn't a city. It wasn't Boston. You know what I'm saying? But it's the biggest city in the uh, northern due east, northeast outside of Boston. I think it was bigger than Manchester back then. Manchester, New Hampshire, that is. Maybe not. But either way. It's bigger it still is, I think, than Portsmouth. So 
outside of Boston in the northern New England, Vermont. I'm not sure how big Burlington is. Either way, Portland was, was you know, the big city for Massachusetts going up to Canada. And so for a little kid to be able to get off the boat and walk up there, man, around downtown Portland. And I went to the, we had a comic book store, right? A record store. Yeah, a comic book store in the Old Port Exchange. A record store on Commercial Street, Congress Street, Congress Street. And uh, I went there and there, and I think I went one other place. Porches, as my mom used to work, which was a, uh, a clothes, kind of like a, uh, in Maryland we had Hex. Porches was like, I guess the main version of Hex. I'm sure Porches has long since gone out of business. Hex has long since gone out of business. Like a clothing store kind of thing. I have no idea what the current clothing stores are nowadays. Department store. I don't think I went in there, though. I don't know why I would have. But uh, they made me McDonald's, I think. They had McDonald's up there to get some French fries. No, I don't think my mom wanted me to go to McDonald's because that's where all the bums were. Yeah, she didn't want me to do that. So I can't remember what I did. I just remember going to the, uh, the comic book store and the record store. And I think I bought an Aerosmith Greatest Hit 12-inch for $3.99. And I probably bought a Ghost Rider comic book, which I'm sure I read back on the boat going home. But, man, what a liberating experience and feeling like a big boy. You know what I'm saying? It was great. I don't think any of my friends got to do that. But the interesting thing was, it was just the trust that my mom had in me. And it was also big because I'm, I'm, I've always been shy. I'm just not that shy anymore just because as you age, you're just like, I don't care. Um, you just get older. You're just like, eh, whatever. But back then, I was real shy. I was always self-aware. Uh, I guess even when I said I wasn't all that aware of being poor. On the island, I wasn't. But off the island, I was. I was different. You know what I'm saying? Because island boys are like hicks you know, for the kids who lived in Portland. Man, I just remember that. And I think if you're a parent, you know, like my age with younger children, my children aren't young anymore, but they're still younger, you know, middle school and high school and college. I think it's important to have the faith to let your kids, you know, loosen up the leash a little bit, if that makes sense. It's tough for women to do, I know that. One time we're on the plane or the train in New Jersey, the Paco speed line, which I used to take to work into Philadelphia every day. And, uh, and Maddie's school, Haddonfield Middle School, was right there off a, a stop for the speed line. So what we did is we got onto the train. I forgot the stop I used to be on. And uh, we got onto it. Now it's two stops inner into a, Philly so I had a what I did is I said okay I got on the train because I had to go this way she had to go that way for my stop and I said just so I got on with her I got on the first and I got off the next stop I said now all you got to do is stay on this train to the next stop and get off and you can walk to school and uh, I thought that was a big deal you know she was sixth grade I think Taking the train in uh, Haddonfield, the speed line by herself. Maybe it was even two stops. I think it might have been two stops. Maybe we got in Collingswood. I can't remember. But anyway, and my wife was nervous. That's what I'm saying. I think women are a lot more nerve-wracked when it comes to, uh, you know, letting your kids, the leash, loose a little bit. She was nervous. But I thought that was a good experience for her. I do. And she was nervous too, Maddie said. She still says, Dad, I can't believe you let me do that. I you know, told them all about my story of you know, walking around Portland, Maine when I was a kid. They said it's not the same thing. I said it absolutely is the same thing. It's actually getting on a boat, which means I had to get on the boat, figure out my way into Portland, figure out my way to get back on the boat. And taking a train, I literally said just to get off two stops from here. It's, it's, it is the same thing. And going from an island into the, like I said, the second biggest city in the northern New England, it's a big deal. But be that as it may, 
you know, but I think it actually helped her to feel her. I, you know, I don't know this for sure, but just she's always been independent. And I think some has to, you know, maybe it's a firstborn thing. I don't know. But I think there is something about said, being said about having the faith and trust of allowing your children to be a little bit freer than you might otherwise want. Now, when it comes to cars, let them drive. I don't know, man. Yeah, that's a challenge right there. Um, yeah, I don't know about that. My wife is telling me about one of her friends that she's in college with, never, drive in co never drove in college, and really didn't start driving until she was like her mid-20s, because as a, when she was 16, she got this major crash. And actually, her sister, when she was 16, got in a major crash too, I guess almost killed her. So she's real scared to drive. I think driving, is a whole lot different than just walking around. But I've always liked to walk because you are in control of your footsteps. Driving, way too many things that are uh, you're contingent on. You're not really free. You're just way too many things that is out of your control, which scares me. But anyway, I think it's good to allow your kids to, to be free to some regard. You know, you hold them accountable if they screwed up. You know, if they take advantage of it, you, you, you know, knock them around a little bit. I'm saying that facetiously, tell you, oh my goodness, child abuse. You know, spank them on the back, on the butt. Whatever it is that you need to do, take away their phone is probably the biggest uh, consequence they can have now. Anyway. Being free is a mindset which I'm always trying to deal with myself, you know, because you are free only when it's internal. And, uh, but I think a lot of that has a lot to do with just, man, making your kids aware that they control things, that they are not being, and this whole thing was like systemic racism stuff. I think that's hugely negative because it says to people, you have no control. <laughs> I think, and that's by design. I truly believe that's by design. You have no control. Let me be there. The Democratic Party, the big government, whatever it is, the Marxist professors to make it right for you because you can't do it because you have no control. You're suffering from systemic racism. I just think that's an ugly, ugly mindset. Regardless of how true that is of systemic racism, I think it's an ugly mindset to encourage people to think they're victims and they can't do anything to establish their own freedom. I do truly think it's by design, by the way. I think there's some evil people out there who get, uh, who feel a need to control. And the first thing they have to do to control is get a group of people who they can say are being controlled to be their, their pawns, their infantrymen, their foot soldiers so they can get power. And I think that's a scary, scary thing. Because then they say, foot soldiers, you have no control. And foot soldiers say, you're right, I have no control. Let me listen to what you say so we can get that control. And the foot soldiers never get the control. Once the power is achieved, the foot soldiers are always the first to go. Anyway, just a little bit of a diatribe about my stories growing up. I'll never get just going to Portland, man. It was nerve wracking. It seems a big buildings. So we didn't have any stoplights. Hardly any cars on Peaks Island. You know what I'm saying? We didn't have any of that crap. But seeing these people, you know, just as crazy, man. It was, uh, it was cool. And uh, obviously, I was just a little kid. Thinking everyone's looking at you like, what's this little kid doing? But, you know, hindsight, no one cares what you're doing. They just care about what they're doing. Everyone's in it for themselves. And that's not a bad thing. But for me, that helped me a lot when I was finally older to realize that no one's sitting there saying, hey, what's Josh doing? No one cares. They just care about whoever they are. Anyway, all right, we'll see you.